you a picture. 2001, we read an article about news of hope, about wings of hope, and we reach out to the president. And, um, and I'm going to tell you a little bit more about our story, but that conversation was a, was a huge turning point in our organization. So, um, but Samaritan Aviation, uh, we work in the South Pacific, Papua New Guinea. Papua New Guinea, it's, the, it's called the land of the unexpected. So that's, uh, as, you, as I talked to you about our story, uh, what we're doing in Papua New Guinea, think about that. That's the slogan for the country. And see Ed over there in the corner, uh, in the back there, one of my favorite guys in the world. Uh, Ed and I go way back, and I'll tell you a little bit more of some, some of our stories. Um, but, you know, you hear uh, Papua New Guinea, you like to say, why Samaritan Aviation, why Papua New Guinea? And I'll tell you, uh, a quick story, um, uh, 2000, uh, 1994, I'm 19 years old and I find myself on um, an island in Papua New Guinea. I still had hair back then, so that is me in that photo, by the way. But 1994, you asked, how did you get to be living in a hut on a little island, remote island in Papua New Guinea? And, and the, the re reality is I was... Uh, raised as a pastor's son, one of five kids. My grandfather was a World War II pilot. He flew P-38s, uh, trained in those, and then flew DC-4s at the end of the war over in uh, Europe. And so I had an aviation background. Two uncles flew airplanes. My cousin was, was a Prowler pilot in the Marine Corps. So I kind of grew up with this uh, passion for aviation as, as a young boy, eight years old. I was like, I'm going to be a commercial pilot. And so that was kind of my dream. Uh, my dad was a minister, and we moved out to Santa Cruz, California the, when I was a teenager, and he ran, started running a homeless mission. And so this idea of God was, was first and foremost in our family because of him being a minister. And then you add this idea of helping people in need with, without expectation, giving them a coat because it was cold, giving them a free meal because they were hungry, and doing that in, in the name of Jesus because God loves us and we are called to love others. And so... That was kind of instilled to me as a teenager working with my family. Uh, as a 16-year-old, I went to Mexico and had a chance to see another culture and help build houses for families down there. And that moment uh, really changed my life. I remember one morning I was sitting reading Psalm 139, and I felt God speak to me. I haven't had Him speak to me since the same way that I felt at that moment, but I heard two things. Mark, I want to use your passion for people and aviation to share my love in a remote part of the world. Now, what do you do with that as a 16-year-old? I went back to California and started looking into what it would take to use aviation to, to serve people. Uh, went back to a little college in Florida, met a guy there who had been born in Papua New Guinea. And there I find myself in 1994 on the backside of this island living with people and seeing the culture of Papua New Guinea for the first time, seeing why they call it the land of the unexpected, seeing why they, it's considered one of the last, uh, most remote uh, frontiers in the world. Living in a hut, hearing stories, people dying. There's one hospital, there's 400,000 people. They're three to four days away. How do they get there? Most of the time they don't get there because there's no way to get there. It's four days by canoe trying to get on a road. Hearing stories of, of, of people just dying from things that we wouldn't even think about. Imagine if the nearest hospital was getting in a car and driving into the middle of the Rocky Mountains. You guys do a lot of that with, with these young kids that even now they're going to get a flight later today it looks like. What an amazing opportunity to use aviation as a tool to make that the, what they're going through so much easier for them. What a blessing that is. And so hearing stories of people dying, seeing needs all around. They brought a little boy to us while we were on the island. He had a tropical ulcer. Half of his leg was, was swollen up and he had this huge ulcer on his leg. And just for a few dollars of the medical supplies, we were able to bandage his leg and potentially save, save this young boy's life. And that had a huge impact on us. And so the question was, how can we turn a three-day trip into a one-hour flight? Would it be possible to bring a seaplane over? There's water everywhere, 700-mile river, size of the Mississippi. There's the ocean, there's islands. Could we bring a float plane over and serve these people? And could we do it at no cost to them? Well, that's a big dream when you're 19 years old and you look like you're 15. And you haven't flown an airplane yet. 
and you're not an aircraft mechanic, you haven't met your wife yet, for me it was a big deal, and, uh, and you don't even have a name for an organization. And we came home, we looked around, nobody else was doing what we felt called to do, and so we uh, naturally, I'm gonna fast forward a little bit here, but I'll show you a couple things. Um, just so you know where Papua New Guinea is, we work in Wewak here, this is the river I'm talking about. Second largest island in the world, 840 languages just on this side. There's 12 to 15 million people. They don't do a very good job at counting people over there, so there's a very big discrepancy of what's listed and what's actual. So we're estimating 15 million there now. Um, second largest island in the world, uh, one of the uh, last frontiers. 14,000 foot mountains running through the middle of the island. And then you have rivers, big rivers on both sides. Um, serving, I was telling you, three days to get to this one hospital. And that was the dream. How could we do that? How could we take a float plane and reach these people who have no hope when they get hit by a snake bite? No hope when they have a breech birth after three days. Uh, no hope when there's a cerebral malaria or any other type of sickness. No hope when there's a tribal fight that happens quite frequently in here, in this area. And uh, how could we do that at no cost? And so, um, so we had this brilliant plan. Somebody donated a logo, which is still the logo we have today on the side of our airplanes. Uh, my wife and I and my buddy and his wife, we stood in front of someone else's airplane in San Diego, and we took this photo. And then my mentor happened to own a printing company. So he printed this for free, this, this little card. This is pre-internet. Pre and uh, we mailed this card out to 330 people. And that was the beginning of Samaritan Aviation. We'd become a 501c3 by this point. And I'll tell you, I thought it was just going to be amazing that people were going to see this dream, they're going to receive this card in the mail, and they were just going to write big checks. Well, I can tell you, from that whole mail out, we raised about $330. But I wasn't discouraged. This is 2000. And I was young, and I felt called, and God had given us a vision, and the need was there. And it was like, if we could just tell the right people, people will respond. And then we see this article in a magazine about Queens of Hope, doing some medical stuff in the middle of the uh, country. We were living out in Colorado. Uh, out in California. So we called Wings of Hope 2001 and we said, hey, we've read about you. We'd love to meet, meet you. We, we're all about partnerships. We see that you guys uh, get donated airplanes sometimes. And we were at the time starting to work in Mexico, flying volunteers uh, down to uh, some clinics down there because we felt like we, New Guinea is the dream, but it's going to take a few years to get there. So what can we do now through aviation while we're getting to that? end of the of the goal and so we started working in mexico flying volunteers and, and so we had a great uh logo and the worst question was someone would say well what kind of planes do you guys fly well we didn't have any planes so 2001 we fly out here you guys were actually in the other hangar at that time and doug doug clements who was the president at that time comes out and we start talking and he he responded to our passion and our, our, our goals and he said, we have this old 182 here, it's 425 Romeo Bravo, 425 RB, it's owned by the Red Baron Pizza Company or something at one point. And he said, we'll sell that to you guys for $15,000 and you can pay us when you get the money. We paid it off in a few months and that was the beginning. We finally had an airplane, we were finally somewhat legitimate, I mean a 182, but still. Uh, Samaritan Aviation, we had a logo on the back of an airplane, and we had an airplane. And Wings of Hope was critical in, in really the first airplane that we ever owned was because uh, you guys had a plane here that we could use to start serving people in Mexico. And a few years later, uh, I, we called Doug and said, hey, we're trying to find a float plane. We we're getting ready to get closer to get to New Guinea, and we need a float plane. So we found this one in Hawaii. Wings of Hope sends somebody out to look at it, ends up coming here in a 40-foot container, and you, you guys uh, ultimately was here for a couple years, but I ended up right behind where this uh, KY is at, is where 
I spent weeks putting that plane back together. Ed and I uh, had many days uh, working on that plane, putting the wings on, putting the, uh, putting the thing back together. We put the engine on here, test flew it, Steve and I test flew it, and uh, four years later, that plane finally got to New Guinea. So it only took us 10 years from mailing this card out to finally arriving in Papua New Guinea. And I'll never forget arriving there with my family. I had a four, five, and seven-year-old. This was the airplane that we got, it was put together here at Wings of Hope. And uh, we put it in a 40-foot container, shipped it to the Capitol, and uh, I put it together with a bag of tools. It took me a week in the Capitol, and we flew it for seven hours in to the north coast of Weewak. Uh, where we are still operating uh, today. And I'll tell you the uh, first story. I, I, uh, we spent 10 years going around the country telling anybody and everybody that if we could just get an airplane to pop in the game, we could save lives. People are dying. They can't get to the only hospital. And I'll never forget Good Friday 2010. I get the call. We have a mother who's been in labor three days. Can you help? I remember putting a stretcher in that airplane. You guys have done that many times here for patients. I remember fueling the plane, rushing out through the clouds, the rain, out to the side of this muddy river. And they, I see this crowd coming and they're bringing this lady on the stretcher. She's completely unconscious. We get her in the plane, nurse in there, and we're 25 minutes later, we land at Wee, in Weewak, unload her, get her in the ambulance, drive her in to the hospital. And I'll never forget the next day, uh, my wife and I came in with our kids and we didn't know if she'd live as they rushed her to emergency surgery. I'll never forget walking around the corner and seeing this lady sitting there alive. And not only that, but she's holding this little baby boy. And seeing two lives that had been saved because of the dream that God had given uh, so many years before. Because of the partners like Wings of Hope who come alongside of us, who believed in us. And that was the reason we were there, saving these lives. And I'll never forget these guys. They looked at us and they said, we'd like you to name our child. You know, I was like, just a country, a month, name your child. Like, uh, Kirsten and I looked at each other, we're like, well, we need to go home and think about this because we can't just give a name to a child, you know? And so we go home and and uh, we came up with this perfect name. We, had a, we wrote it all out meaning of the name, the whole thing. We go back in there and we're all excited. We're like, we have a name for the child. And Antonia, who's the mother, looks at me and she says, well, we've already given him a name and we've named him after you, Mrs. Mark. And uh, amazing, this little baby boy is Mark. He's now 13 years old. And uh, I've had a chance to go back in and, and spend time with him, uh, with Antonia. And Guys, we've been operate, offering access to home, medevac, seven days a week. We've delivered over 230,000 pounds of medical supplies. We've helped stop polio outbreaks. We've helped stop polio, uh, cholera outbreaks, whooping cough, uh, any other type of sickness that's going on over there. This year already, we've flown almost 200 patients in, just in the first uh, six months of the year. This is going to be by far, we're probably going to double this year the amount of patients that we've ever flown in. The organization is growing. It's not about just me and my wife and our family anymore. Our team is growing. We have two airplanes there now. A third airplane is in the container that's going to be getting shipped over there in the next couple weeks. And uh, we're so excited to see that, that the ability uh, and the capacity to reach more people and, and to uh, be a light over there. Uh, one of the things you guys helped us do, we, we, we do some nurses training as well. We flew in nurses from all remote villages along the river. And we did a week of training with them. And you guys helped us fund that as well. Uh, a lot of these nurses had had zero training since graduation, some of them 20 years. So to be able to bring them in and train them on, on childbirth, give them stethoscopes, give them blood pressure cups, oxyometers, the ability for them to give us information that we need when we get calls for better backs and up, up their skill training. It's a huge thing. And so thank you guys for, for partnering with us uh, in that way as well. But I wanted to um, tell you just kind of where we're at right now as an organization. We, we're, um, just so you know what we're doing. Uh, we've just been in a 5.3 million uh, capital raise last year. We've raised 5 million so far. 
uh, including a check I picked up from the Papua New Guinean government for 900000 just a couple weeks ago. And so the funds are coming in, but what we're doing is we're building a, we bought some land and we're building a training center and eight staff houses. So as you visualize Samaritan growing, just think about how our goal is to train more locals, uh, also to have a safe uh, place for our families that are coming over there. And then uh, expansion, we mentioned in the video. I want to tell you a quick story. I um, Last summer, in uh, June, I was over in Papua New Guinea, and um, the goal was actually, as you saw in that video, we were going to expand to the western province first, which is actually the province right next to this, on this side. And um, and as you're, as you're looking at the whole country, uh, you can see kind of this is where we're at now. Uh, this is where we're looking at going, the south side. And um, I was sitting with, uh, I ended up in Kerama, which is the capital of this province. There's no roads from the rest, for the rest of this province. It's all just water, rivers, uh, inlets from the ocean. This is the goal here. And, um, I'm sitting here with the uh, director for outreach for health, the CEO of the hospital that's here, and uh, the CEO of the province, and, and different medical health workers that are there. And I put this map up on the wall. There's a little projector in this little office. And I put this map up and I said, okay, we're sitting here with all of your funding and what you guys do on an annual basis. How far are you guys reaching out here? And they drew a circle, and the circle went to right here. What about what happens to them when they have a breech birth, when they have a snake bite, tuberculosis, any other type of sickness? And I'll never forget the lady that was in charge of rural health looked at me and she said, well, they're just used to dying. And she said it offhandedly, almost like a, just a statement. I sat there, I was stunned. And I just felt at that moment, God said, this is where Samaritan needs to go. This is why we exist, to go reach people that nobody else cares about, that nobody even knows lives out here. And that's where we're going next. That airplane that you guys saw uh, sitting in the hangar uh, just a few months ago, maybe a year ago, uh, almost, that was here, is in a container right now. It'll be shipped over to, to New Guinea. We're going to be expanding over in this area, living on a village right in the middle here, which will allow us to turn these areas that have never been serviced into 20, 30 minute flights in the seaplane and offer access and hope to 200,000 people living in these remote regions. So that's where Samaritan Aviation is going. And we're so excited to see uh, this. Uh, we have the vision. We need more pilots. Uh, Pilot families, our families come over for two years at a time. If you guys uh, know anybody who is interested in, in flying and, and being uh, passionate about moving over there for a couple years at a time, raising all their own money, and then being uh, interrogated by our staff, and, uh, then please let us know. It's not easy to find the right people, but I know they're out there, and uh, we have amazing staff, but we're, we're excited that, about the vision, we're excited about where we're going. It's about having more capacity to serve more people, to make more of an impact. And I see you guys doing that here. I've never seen four airplanes with the Wings of Hope logo on it before. When I came in 2001, you had one 206. And now I see a Navajo sitting out here, which is a whole other level of airplane. So guys, you guys have grown your capacity here, and God's given us vision to grow our capacity at the beginning. So, I just want to say thank you guys for what you're doing. You guys coming, volunteering, is what's allowing this organization to succeed and impact the people that they're impacting. So please continue to do that. Uh, continue what you're doing. Uh, you guys make an amazing impact through aviation. 29 different states. That's awesome. So thank you guys for what you do. We're grateful for Wings of Hope. We're grateful for your continued partnership. And uh, look forward to telling you more stories in the future of lives changed and lives saved on the other side of the world. Thank you guys for your time.